Well, you're, I think you're opening though. Excuse me. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Joint Committee on Cybersecurity Information Technology and Biotechnology today. Um, today, our focus is on an introduction and discussion of the capabilities and issues around artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, we had several bills proposed on AI uh, this past session and um, ran out of time with a lot of them, so we've decided to really dig in over the interim. But I just wanted to start, start off by saying that uh, Chair Kaiser and I have had several conversations about both the opportunity and the risks of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think we want to give both the, um, the, the attention that they deserve. Um, in preparing for today's hearing, I saw a statistic from Goldwyn Sachs, and they foresee AI creating a 7% increase in global GDP and a productivity increase of 1.5%. But then they also uh, predict a loss or degradation of about 300 million jobs. So it's it's really a, a tricky subject here. Um, now, this is something that the state of Maryland cannot and will not uh, afford to neglect. And today we're starting our work on AI for this as a committee. Um, and we're going to have two hearings this year. This first one is really um, a primer. So for all of you watching out there, if you know everything there is to know on AI, you could turn into the next one in the fall. Um, but for us, we really wanted to make sure that we lay a, a base level of understanding for the members of our committee and all of our interested stakeholders. So uh, for today, we'll, we'll get the basics on the table. And then in October, we'll dive deeper into the, to what AI means, particularly at the state level, around issues like health policing, hiring, the, the consequential decisions that are out there that the state that plays a role in. Um, so today I'm pleased that we're, we'll be joined by a number of really expert um, folks from UMBC and the UMD Center for Health and Homeland Security who will help us understand the current state of this ever evolving field. And the amount of brain power in this room is really overwhelming. So thank you all for coming and devoting your time to helping us understand this really important issue. Um, so just to break it down for today, I, we have three panels. Um, each one will have about a 20 minutes for a presentation and 20 minutes for Q&A. We're starting just a bit late, so hopefully we'll end just past three o'clock. Um, the first panel is a, a primer, Opportunities and Challenges, by the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. We're then going to go to uh, the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security and focus on state action and artificial intelligence second. Um, and then we're going to wind up with back to UMBC with an overview of the current research that they're proposing. Um, so uh, really getting more futuristic as we move out. Um, so that is a brief introduction and I'll turn it over to my fabulous co-chair, uh, Chair Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hester, and it's been a real pleasure these nearly six months uh, of working together and a lot of collaboration. I want to thank the committee members who are here. I want to thank all of you who are here for all of uh, your input and to let you know you're not off the hook after today. We're going to keep uh, relying on you and coming back to you, and we, and we thank you for all of that. Uh, as Chair Hester already said about challenges and opportunities, I think a lot of people have been reading this past year about chat GPT. And I also teach at the University of Maryland and one of my colleagues showed up and said, here's how you use ChatGPT. And even if you think your assignments aren't the type that students can use ChatGPT for, oh, they will, and they can. Um, but understand that it's a tool and it's a tool like other things. And we have to stop looking at it as maybe we have been as a way of like not writing and it's cheating. And remember there was a point in time uh, where allowing students to have calculators during tests or having spell checks and grammar checks on our computers. And we don't then say that students are bad writers or can't learn how to write. So looking at it in some of those positive ways. I think the other thing, despite it being in the news so much this past year, it's being used and being developed and studied for years now. Uh, and, and it's past time for there to be some type of legislative framework. And so that's part of what we're trying to figure out and how should it be used externally, how should it be used internally within government? So again, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Chair Hester, and I guess we can begin the meeting. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite the first panel on the primer to come up. And while we're here, I just want to acknowledge, um, thank the members for being here. Um, I know thank some you. folks are, are, are watching diligently from home and text me questions, but around the table today, we have Senator 
Watson, yeah. Delegate Ken Kerr, Delegate Spellmark, Delegate Bartlett, and Delegate Kipke. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Hester and uh, Chair Kaiser. Uh, my name is Anupam Joshi. I'm here with my um, colleagues, uh, Professor Christine Mallinson, um, who's uh, the Lipsis Dist Distinguished Professor in Language, Literacy, and Culture, and uh, Professor Tim Finan, the Hackerman Chair of uh, Computer Science and Electrical Engineering. Um, we'll have some slides that give a little bit about our background, uh, but the three of us will try to condense in the next 20 minutes what we normally teach, you know, a semester or two, um, covering. And that does mean that we will not have an opportunity to talk about our own research very much, but you will hear later from uh, four of our young faculty members who are doing wonderful work in this space. So um, with that, um, so I'm using some military jargon here. So the bottom line upfront summary is that AI is something that combines computing with philosophy and neuroscience. But today we're mostly going to talk about the computer science piece. The term AI came out of a 1956 workshop that DARPA organized. It has uh, some people that are now recognized as the giants in, in this field. And it's gone through several cycles that have given very useful technologies that have just disappeared into the fabric of society. So uh, the common complaint AI folks have is that, well, once it works, it's no longer AI, it's just yet another tool that you use. So. Uh, I don't know how many, many of you remember the infamous uh, little clip that used to appear in Microsoft that would make suggestions to you or the, the grammar stuff, it's all AI of various flavors. And Microsoft now will, um, in their new stuff, you just give it a like a presentation and say, hey, you know, whatever, prepare PowerPoints out of this and it's going to do it. So that, that technology is about to roll out. So we're at, we are at another inflection uh, point for AI. And we heard about ChatGPT. We're going to deliberately not say very much about ChatGPT today because that's a whole thing in of itself. But that's a class of AI applications called large language models. And as the chairs um, rightly observed, AI has great benefits to society, but also carries big risks like any other technology. Um, we hope to convey the message that the system, certainly UMBC and UMB, but other elements of the system have great strengths in this area. And you know, you'll hear from some of our faculty, but we can also be a resource um, for the state uh, because in academics, we can collaborate in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary ways that industry cannot. So for example, as you think of regulations, you need people who have skills in policy, in law and the technology to come together to think about that. So the other part is a question that um, Delegate Kaiser and, and um, Senator Hester asked us, which is, well, what can the legislature be doing? So I think we're making a great start. The first thing is for, is for members of this August body to actually understand the technology just a little bit um, so that as you frame laws and regulations, um, you're well informed and also understand how AI is impacting society, um, its opportunities and challenges. There's I can't think of any endeavor today where AI cannot be helpful in some way or the other. And as you understand this, there is a lot of hype around AI today. We're on sort of the up point of the Gartner hype cycle. Um, for some of us who've been in this field for a long time, we've kind of gone through these cycles in the past. Um, but there's also a lot of fear and uncertainty around AI. And I think education can help with that. I think where needed, this body and hopefully the federal government um, can regulate not so much the technology, but the impact of AI on society. And you'll hear a little bit of, from us on the EREGs, but mostly from my colleagues from the Center for Health and Homeland Security on, on the regulation piece. And as I said earlier, we are a resource, those of us in the system that are happy to help and support because we really want, I think if you look at the core technologies that are going to have significant economic impact in the near future, um, 
AI, cyber, and quantum. The state is already regarded as one of the cyber capitals. You know, we're pushing to be the quantum capital, and we really want to be thinking the same thing about AI. So we want to encourage the development of technology and education around AI um, in the state. So I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves very quickly. Um, yeah, my name is Tim Finan. I'm a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at UMBC, and I'm privileged to hold the Willard and Hackerman Chair in Engineering currently. Uh, I've worked on AI, both uh, core technology and, and applications for more than 50 years. And throughout my career, the focus has been on uh, representing and using knowledge and also language understanding. Uh, but a lot of it's been applied and currently one of the uh, most important applications I'm working on, areas I'm working on is cybersecurity. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us again. Um, <clears throat> my name is Christine Mounds, and I'm also privileged to be the Lippitz Distinguished Professor of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at UMBC, where I'm a professor of language, literacy, and culture. Um, my area, which I've been working in for uh, the past two to three decades here, is at the interface of spoken language and societal impact, especially education and technology. Um, and my expertise basically centers on the principles that neither AI nor technology can be properly understood without an understanding of humans, um, including human language and society itself, including uh, biases, um, and that we need a deeper understanding of society to go along with our understanding of technology and its applications. And um, my name is Anupam Joshi. I'm the, I have the privilege of being the Oros Family Professor and the Chair of the Computer Science and Electrical Engineering and the uh, Director of the Cybersecurity Center. Um, and like my colleagues here, I have decades of experience in this space. Um, my expertise has been not so much in the core AI technology, although I work in that space, but I apply AI to a variety of fields. And in the past, I've cybersecurity, healthcare, um, as Christine mentioned, narrative construction. So, you know, you're hearing increasingly about not just misinformation that our state adversaries are using, but getting this, releasing just enough pieces of slight misinformation and a bunch of regular stuff to force the thinking to go in a certain way. So we're working on how to detect those kinds of things. So I want to start um, and just spend a few minutes to understand sort of what is AI, right? And, and some of the things. Now, this is a foundational question. And it's a foundational question because before we agree on what is AI, we have to understand, we have to agree on what is intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I suspect if I go around this room and say, well, what's intelligence? I will get a variety of slightly different operational definitions. And that's the same problem with AI. I'll try to summarize some of them, but the, it's a history of philosophical debate that stretches back centuries, right? Even though the term AI is new. So for example, uh, Rene Descartes argued that the mind and the brain are two different things. Burton Russell argued that they're the same thing. Which one do you believe, right? Um, why, why is it important? Well, I, see, I, I say I see the color red. Well, when you and I say we see the color red, are we seeing the same thing? Because if we don't understand this distinction, it's hard to figure out how to get a computer to understand the color red. And so in 50s, Turing wrote a very nice paper called Can Machines Think and proposed what we now say is the Turing test, which is the basic idea that, well, if you can have a conversation in the machine and you can't figure out whether it's a machine or a human, then it's intelligent. Well, a lot of people think that is the test of intelligence, a lot of other people say, no, that is not intelligence. That's just simulating in intelligence. And um, so John, uh, John Searle, um, a, a well-known American philosopher in the 80s, wrote a very influential paper uh, that's called Chinese in a Room. Um, and it's an interesting paper. It said, imagine that John Searle, who knows not a word of the Chinese language, was put inside a room and given like infinite uh, you know, speed where people would send in characters on, written on a piece of paper, which were Chinese language. And then he would just look up and say, when you see these characters, what characters do you give back? And he would give those back out. 
did he understand Chinese or not? So there's, there's lots of debate. So what we are going to focus today is on artificial narrow intelligence, which is what you see a lot of stuff happening. The ability to do a specific tasks that humans can do well, as opposed to the more general definition of intelligence. Let me skip this because um, most of what we understand as AI is in, the, is in sort of the bottom right quadrant there, systems that seem to act rationally for a specific task. So I know all the discussion today is around chat GPT, but you're seeing AI in a lot of different places, right? So if you look, if you, if you search for um, our governor on you know, the web, on Google, you'll get this little box. It's called the info box on the side. Well, what powers it is an AI technology called knowledge graphs, right? But again, we don't think of it as AI. It is AI. It's, it's the ability to reason about stuff and infer things that powers um, a lot of that. We're going to focus today mostly on machine learning because that seems to be the biggest and most influential piece of AI right now. But I did want to make sure you understood that AI is not just machine learning. It's significantly beyond that as well. And then there are applications in natural language and computer vision, and you'll hear more about that. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, um, Professor Pino. Well, uh, as uh, Anupam said, um, AI has been uh, a focus of activity since the 50s. And uh, this image shows a timeline of kind of significant uh, advances or focuses over, you know, that 60 years plus. Um, currently, in the last 20 years or so, machine learning has dominated AI. Uh, and it's really been fueled by increased uh, computing capacity and also the availability of huge amounts of data, uh, primarily through the web. So uh, when we look at machine learning, uh, it's often divided into three categories shown here. Uh, the first one is what we call supervised machine learning, where we have uh, data associated with labels, uh, like uh, documents and whether the sentiment is positive or negative, uh, or uh, students and uh, information about uh, their background and whether or not they're offered a scholarship. And the goal is to train a system that could predict uh, the right label for new data that it hasn't seen before. The second area is unsupervised learning. Here's where we have a lot of data uh, and we know something about what we wanna get from it, but we don't have labels. Uh, so example, uh, learning words that have a similar meaning based on them occurring in a similar context. Uh, so this is a very different kind of machine learning, but is very important for some tasks. And a third is what we call reinforcement learning. And this is where we get uh, the system, the AI system has feedback uh, from the environment about whether the decisions it's made are good or bad. And uh, this is often used in uh, developing game playing systems. So here's an example of a supervised learning that uh, a trivial example. Suppose we had a lot of images of uh, different kinds of animals and we wanna learn how to recognize images of puppies so our training data has images and the label puppy or not puppy. Uh, we train a classifier and then we can test it with some held out data or uh, use it to predict uh, an image it's never seen before, whether it's a puppy or not, not a puppy. So uh, AI has applications and impact on almost every field, every discipline. Uh, consider medicine, for example. Uh, the University of Maryland uh, Medical uh, uh, School has a lot of people who are applying data science and AI to uh, medical problems, for example, uh, analyzing images. Uh, a second area is um, business and finance. Uh, again, AI has been used and is increasingly being used more uh, to support both finance and business. Uh, it could be something like deciding uh, alg algorithms, developing better algorithms for trading, uh, but it could also be things like fraud detection, financial forecasting, credit scoring, et cetera. Third area is uh, climate science and weather prediction. Our ability to predict the weather locally has vastly increased 
uh, improved over the last decade. And a lot of this has come from uh, using machine learning. Uh, and a third area, a fourth area is uh, transportation. Uh, we're all aware of autonomous vehicles. They're operating in some cities, pretty much in a test mode. Uh, but uh, uh, that is something that's possible today and will be more, more frequent in the future. Now, all of these areas, all these applications of AI offer real benefits, but they also come with uh, some potential risks. Uh, ben general benefits for AI uh, mean decreased repetitive work, uh, increased production in goods and services, creation of new jobs, accelerating scientific research, uh, improving education and information access. Uh, but along with them do come risks, for example, uh, impact on existing jobs. Some people may not uh, be able to compete with an AI system for certain jobs. Uh, surveillance and persuasion. Uh, AI can be used in a negative way uh, to spread information or try to persuade people. Uh, biased decision-making. Uh, since we're often training with data uh, from the web, uh, often that could be uh, biased and we have to be careful about that. Uh, and the final thing I'll mention would be uh, a lethal, a lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, as the military begins to use AI technology, uh, there are some real risks as well. So I know we are um, only five minutes away from, from finishing our briefing. So I'll say, I'll be quick about this, right? There are the sort of the artificial super intelligence problem and it's, ter it's often termed as the gorilla problem um, uh, because millions of years ago, presumably an accidental mutation in the gorilla genome sequence led to humans. And today we, I mean, the, the gorillas, don't have sort of much of a control of most of the earth, right? So there is that very low probability risk of Skynet and Terminator and things. So we're not gonna talk about those today. Uh, there can also be problems with algorithms and data. We'll spend just a little bit of time um, to mention that, right? So um, look at the things at the bottom. And if I say group them into two, would you group them as circles versus triangles or red versus blue, right? Top versus bottom, right? Left versus, those are what are called inductive biases, right? You're trying to induce a relationship given data, given how you write your algorithm, you might do things differently. So there are problems at this level. And again, this is a whole class to itself. So I'm not going to try and even flash the math for this, but the way to think about it is, are you, um, even though you are not using any data that runs afoul of protected classes, right? Are you effectively inferring information about a protected class from the data you have? Or are you getting complete nonsense? So many years ago, this is probably an urban legend, but they were trying to uh, use machine learning to get uh, satellite images recognized as whether they're having tanks or not. And it turned out that all the examples where there were tanks were taken on a cloudy day and all the examples you know, without tanks were on a sunny day. And so the algorithm learned, oh, whenever there are clouds, there are tanks, right? Complete nonsense, but machine learning can do that. So there are those problems, but there is also, and th th this has been discussed so thoroughly that I don't want to spend a lot of time today on this, but fundamentally, right? That just what last week there was news that the medical, uh, professionals are being asked not to use BMI data anymore because it was done mostly on Caucasian males and it's unclear what it means for someone like me, right? So same issue. Did the data you train on, was it representative? Was it biased? Does it change over time, right? Was there informed consent on using the data? Google uses the data I generate all the time. Does it have my informed consent? right? Um, or more importantly, if I go to a doctor and they have some of my data, can they in-house train some algorithms on recognizing diseases without telling me that they're using my, is there law and regulation there, right? Um, there is a lawsuit right now where um, some freelance um, artists are complaining that these generative models trained on their data, which they put in public domain, and now are throwing them out of business. So, you know, there's lots of issues like this, but 
I want to give uh, Christine a chance to make the point that AI systems are more than technology. Thank you so much. So I'm going to continue this thread about um, risks and opportunities here for AI. Um, I think we've touched on now that we need to understand the interdependence of AI with, with uh, society. So there are imperfections, biases, weaknesses in the AI data that can come from the input data itself, which may come from humans and therefore reflect the implicit biases or explicit biases that humans uh, often bring to the table. That leads to biased results, which are not as generalizable as we may perceive them to be. Okay, so there's this risk in using AI as sort of this black box um, where we, you know, don't quite understand what's going into it, but take at face value what's coming out of it. Um, and then with the rush towards AI and and perhaps overgeneralizing from it is a society are the multiple societal challenges like lack of ethical frameworks for how to guide the use of this technology um, and the cre increasingly serious role of AI in misinformation and disinformation. And I'm going to give you an example here. Um, so we know that AI is very powerful, right? That's the premise of our discussion. But the human brain is also a very powerful supercomputer as well. And it has specific strengths that AI cannot yet match. This is where we get to the opportunity piece, is the opportunity of make, making sure that humans are brought back in or kept at the table. So think of uh, Tim's example with the puppy classifier and how you have to put so much uh, data in to help the um, AI technology recognize which of these six different pictures is a puppy. So now think of language, which all in all of its vast complexity is much more complex, variable, and innovative than uh, you know what what we the images that we might create of a of a puppy, and then add that with there being six thousand languages in the world. Okay, what humans bring to the table is a unique a uniquely situated brain for understanding language and being very sensitive and flexible with understanding language in its all of its diversity and flexibility and variation and being able to pick up on that in ways that AI cannot yet pick up on. So this means that when we get to the to the question of human discernment and, and processing, that humans are still better um, than AI at being more powerful and discerning and picking up and understanding the most subtle of linguistic cues. And my example here comes from um, some of my own current NSF funded research, um, which is leveraging human discernment ability. So what we're doing is bringing together linguistics with machine learning to in, in innovative ways to detect audio deepfakes, which is synthetic audio, false voices, vocal impersonations. And what we find is that by incorporating linguistics, we can both better train the algorithms to pick up on linguistic cues and also better train humans to pick up on linguistic cues. So when there are societal um, challenges that result from fraud, you're gonna have a human who's better able in real time to, to recognize that perhaps this may be a fraudulent voice or spoofed audio or an impersonation. So in that way, we're helping combat um, disinformation and misinformation and that in, in increasingly major um, societal level challenge that's a real threat to open information and democracy. Thank you, Christine. So my colleagues from CHHS are going to talk about the regulations I'm going to just skip. I just want to mention that there are great um, sort of things that this committee could look at, especially the EU uh, proposal that just came out uh, a few weeks ago, and that's being uh, moving up the chain there. Um, but it it sort of focuses on deciding what the risk is, and then deciding how much the regulation should be. So it's not so much concerned about what the technology is, but uh, risk and accountability. Um, so let me just stop there. Um, with the slide that I had given in the beginning and see if there are any questions um, that we can help answer. And I know we went a few minutes over, but I apologize. Thank you very much. That was definitely a whirlwind tour through uh, a lot of experience that you have. Um, I'd like to ask if any committee members have a question. Delia Bartlett. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for this presentation. This is great. I appreciate the um, quick synopsis on something very, very complicated. So, you know, I can appreciate the legislation, but how do you regulate AI? Um, are you regulating, I guess you're re regulating the humans, but then how do you regulate the humans when we say that the human brain is actually 
more advanced or, or has more capabilities because you're constantly, I feel like we're constantly in this little, um, you know, circle or, or, or you know, uh, race with technology. So what are some of the specific examples, if you have a few, um, on how to actually regulate the um, community? Um, so I think, uh, Dalgit, you're going to hear more about this from our colleagues um, at, at, at UMB. Uh, but one specific example um, that the EU has put forth is saying that the risk of using biometrics for real-time recognition in a public space is simply unacceptable, right? So they have kind of this categorization saying, this is unacceptable. So they're saying they will simply not allow any AI or any other kind of technology to get deployed that is that can be used to recognize a natural person in real time in a public space, except, and you know, you know how these things work. So the exceptions are uh, cases of uh, kidnapping, um, cases where a person has committed a crime that would lead to a sentence of more than three years, and uh, cases of terrorism. So they're very narrowly tailored exceptions. Mm -hmm. But I, but I think the meta point you're making, uh, ma'am, is exactly right, right? This is sort of one of these races that's continuous and we just have to, as technology evolves, because it is, even if we decide as a whole country to say, we are not gonna to touch this technology, there are other countries that are using it even today is in ways that, you know, from an ethical point of view, I would personally find uh, very objectionable, but so we have to figure out how to regulate it and work around it. I don't know if my colleagues said anything to add. Uh, thank you. I'd like to ask a question of uh, Professor Mallinson. A uh, part of what you said about like understanding whether an audio has been machine generated or fake voice or something else. To me, it feels like with an arms race in general, when someone figures out a better defense, someone figures out a better offense and back and forth. So if I'm a, if I'm creating a, a video that could be picked up as fake, I would think at some point because of that technology, I would figure out how to make it sound less fake. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that absolutely is that fair to say? Yes, that's super, uh, super insightful. And in fact, um, folks in the literature have called it an arms race as well. This is why we're investing in the human side, because the algorithms will never, it is an arms race, right? It's sort of a chasing its own tail. The algorithms, as soon as you get better, will find a way to beat the algorithms. So this is why we're investing in the human side too, to leverage that human discernment capability. So that hopefully, um, one, one analogy that you can think of is kids these days are pretty um, consistently taught critical media literacy. For instance, don't believe everything, everything you see on a Facebook post. What we're hoping to do is bring a piece of that um, to the understanding of uh, fake content, fake audio, to say we need to train people on how to be a better listener, a more discerning listener, because humans are still more sensitive. Um, you can just think about all the technology you use, Siri, Alexa, and you know, um, disarming your devices at home, and how sometimes Sometimes it can't always catch who you are, catch your voice if you're saying it in a rushed way. Humans are still much better on that piece. So we're investing in looking at ways to improve um, education, especially in K-12. Right now, we're focusing on undergraduate education to figure out, is it possible, and we're showing that it is, to teach humans to be a better listener, just like we've already taught humans, especially this new generation, to be a more discerning consumer of uh, what they see online. So I think we have time for one last quick question, Delia Hill. <laughs> that narrows it down considerably. Um, I guess what I'd like to hear from you, I, I mean, I love what you're talking about and that, you know, in the, the depth of this, it's a lot like genetics, right? And once it's out of the bag, it's out of the bag. Um, and algorithmic biases are at the heart of what the problem is with AI, right? In, in terms of the harm that it can do. So. We have scholars, academicians who've asked for a pause. Uh, Maryland has tried for the past several years to get legislation through to somehow take a bigger look. And I commend the chairs for finally 
taking a real look at this issue. How much time do we have to catch up and get in front of this in your, in your opinions? Predictions are hard, uh, Dr. Hill, <laughs> incredibly hard. Um, I, I would not even I would not even venture. I would just say that we need to start now and hope that we're doing um, um, stuff in time. It's it's but I think again, I mean I think you mentioned right uh, some of the stuff around biotechnology, right? So I mean, CRISPR, right? We could do really, really bad stuff. And it has done bad stuff in some places overseas, but you know, we've kind of at least put some guidelines in place now. For us, as Christine was mentioning, we do teach our students ethics, right? I mean, when we teach these classes, we, whether it's a cybersecurity class or an AI class, we talk about the ethical things, but um, as the previous question asked, controlling humans is hard, right? And, and academicians, we're not in a good position to, we can teach on what is appropriate, but we can't control. So I, I would just say that we should start like yesterday and then hope that we're doing it Thank you very much um, for both the question and the answer. I'd like to encourage our members and any members who are watching at home just to jot down additional questions. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is the first hearing and we're gonna be working on this all interim. And so we really want to get at the deeper questions and the nuances of the questions. So just save them in the email committee council. That'd be great. Thank you all so very, very much. Thank you, Senator Thank Hester you. And, and Chair uh, Kaiser. Um, I think Senator Watson had a question, but we're happy to answer it offline during one of the breaks. And I have my emails up there in case people- Great, thank you so much. Okay, so we're now shifting to our second panel of the day. Um, and this one is really uh, looking at what other states are doing with a, with a slight overview of also what the federal government um, has done and what the EU has done. But really, when I asked uh, Dr. Yellen to help prepare this, I said, can you let us know what other states are doing? And so um, on the second panel, we have um, Dr. Ben Yellen from the Public Policy and External Affairs in the Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. We also have... Um, uh, fabulous research assistant, Quinn Laking from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security also. Um, and with that, I will welcome you both. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair Hester and Co-Chair uh, Kaiser, and thank you for having us at this hearing today. My name is Ben Yellen. I am the Program Director for Public Policy and External Affairs at the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. And just quickly, uh, very quickly about CHHS. Uh, we are housed within the University of Maryland on the campus of the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Uh, generally, we consult with state and local governments on emergency management, homeland security related issues that extends to things like cybersecurity policy, public health emergency preparedness. We are also an academic center. Uh, we have adjunct faculty, including myself at the University of Maryland uh, School of Law. Uh, we teach courses on topics ranging from counterterrorism uh, to a course I teach on national security and electronic surveillance. Uh, and then we also uh, are lucky enough to run a program with law students uh, who are excellent externs and research assistants for us. Uh, and in coordination with Senator Hester, we task several of those uh, externs, including our excellent research assistant, Quinn Laking, uh, to do a 50 state survey on uh, what state governments are doing about artificial intelligence. Uh, I will gloss over this in about 10 seconds, uh, just by noting that I was pleased to co-chair the 2021 ad hoc subcommittee of the Maryland Cybersecurity Council uh, with Senator Hester, uh, and uh, that my contact information is there in case anybody has questions after this presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Quinn, to introduce herself and then get into the presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Quinn Laking. I'm a rising third year at the University of Maryland Law. I'm focusing on studying cybersecurity and intellectual property law. I've been a research assistant since last fall and an extern since the summer for CHHS. And I'm also on the Maryland Journal of International Law. So today we're going to be doing an overview of the legal landscape in the U.S. for AI. I'm a fan of science fiction, so I decided to put an Isaac Asimov quote in here, which is today's science fiction is tomorrow's science fact. So welcome to tomorrow. Um, so right up top, I just have a list of the policy concerns in general that um, is warranting legislation on AI. 
So some of those concerns are unchecked dissemination of misinformation, um, deep fakes, which is um, artificially created images that look real, academic dishonesty among students, displacement of the labor force if AI takes on those jobs, um, different states and the US in general desire to be a leader in AI, both technologically and economically. There's national security concerns having to do with international surveillance, data privacy concerns, perpetuation of discrimination through AI, proliferation of scams and spam through AI, copyright and other intellectual property concerns, as well as the mental health and wellness of the nation's children. So in general, AI has both good things and bad things about it. I just listed three for each here as an example of what's been in the news lately. Um, some of the pros, for example, really close to home here in Maryland is um, a machine learning algorithm actually slash sepsis deaths at five hospitals. Uh, pharmaceutical companies use AI to be able to predict what molecule will be best used in their drug, speeding up the process by which they can put drugs out and help save lives. AI programs can also um, help regulate our energy sector, creating good predictive models so that we can save money and time when we're trying to save energy. But some of the downsides to AI can be such things such as um, facial recognition can be used by law enforcement. And it's shown that that's repeatedly targeted people of color compared to white people. Amazon used an AI career recruiting tool um, until they realized it was discriminating against female job seekers, and then they stopped using it. And um, AI generated images were used in a recent political campaign portraying two political figures as close collaborators when in fact they had never had the interactions that were in the photographs and that was used to try to forward a political campaign and the viewers didn't know that the image was faked. So we're going to start at a more broad place with the White House. Um, they've put out a blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights. Uh, an overview of that Bill of Rights would be that a US citizen has a right to safe and effective systems of AI, meaning that the machine learning tool has been tested and shown to be accurate and effective with its output. You would also be protected from algorithmic discrimination, such as what I said with Amazon and it was discriminating against female job seekers. You would have a right to data privacy. You would also have a right to being notified when AI is being used to process some information of yours and an explanation of how that algorithm works. And you could also have a right to a human alternative to the AI and um, have uh, an investigatory system if the AI didn't act appropriately. Biden also announced that um, he, there's some new actions that the White House is taking to help promote AI. So they're investing in the research and development of AI. There's also an, um, going to be an assessment of existing AI systems to see for their accuracy and whether they're discriminatory. And OMB is releasing draft policy guidance for um, public comment on AI's use in government. Uh, in Congress, just down the road in DC, we have two bills that have been in introduced. The first is the Assess AI Act, which would create a task force and do a top to bottom review of existing AI policies across the federal government. And this would be looking to make sure that AI is not um, violating any civil rights, civil liberties, privacy, or due process rights. And the other act that was introduced was the TAG Act, which would require federal agencies to notify individuals when they're interacting with AI so that you know it's not a, a human being on the other side of the interaction. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has also scheduled three briefings for senators so they can be informed about AI and how to best regulate it. And one of those briefings will be uh, classified because it'll be about national security and defense. Internationally, um, our wonderful panel before us already talked about the EU Artificial Intelligence Act. We also have some bullet points here that mirror what they said. Um, other countries abroad, Canada already has a comprehensive data privacy law. So they have incorporated AI protections that are currently proposed in their legislature. And then over in China, they've also introduced um, legislation that AI be consistent with their social order, avoid discrimination, and protects intellectual property as well. So that's the overview, big picture. We're going to bring it down to the state level now. So some of the challenges that states face trying to regulate AI is you have to balance between allowing innovation of AI and also protecting people from the possible harmful effects of AI. So if you went too far in either direction, you might stifle innovation, which would be bad technologically moving forward and possibly economically moving forward. But you also, if you completely lack regulation, you may have citizens be harmed by discriminatory effects of AI. 
And so that's a challenge as well as, as each state begins regulating AI, you're getting a patchwork of law across the country. And um, many of these businesses are national. So they have to try to meet all of the different regulations across each state. These are, some, these are some quick statistics on the legal landscape of AI. So first, since 2018, at least 13 states have established commissions or tax task forces that are specifically dedicated to looking at AI and how to regulate it. Since 2019, at least seven states have passed laws to mitigate bias and limit use of AI, both in government and the private sector. In 2023, 27 states, DC and Puerto Rico, considered over 80 bills related to AI. So it's definitely the new hot topic. And in 2022, more than 25% of all US businesses use some form of artificial intelligence. So this is the real uh, money slide here. This is a, the survey that me and my fellow externs did for the state bills across the country. On the left side, you have the general categories that these bills fall into, what they're trying to do and what the bill says. And then we have the number of states who passed a bill that has to do with that and then the number of states that have it proposed but not yet passed. So the first category is committee or task force. This is generally a bill or a law that says a committee or a task force will be created to look at AI and consider how to regulate it. This could be solely a legislative committee or it could be made up of stakeholders um, such as people in the tech industry, um, legal research teams, and they are there to make recommendations to the legislature about how to best regulate AI. The next category is data privacy. These are bills and laws that have to do with um, generally data privacy rights. So like you might have a right to request that you are not tracked by cookies when you interact with a certain business. It could also be data privacy specifically aimed at children and having them have certain data privacy rights when they interact with the internet. Um, it could also involve data privacy that you can know what data about you is collected or you have the right for it not to be sold. There's really a, a whole package here of different protections you can get in data privacy. The third category is discrimination. So these bills and laws are generally that uh, you have the right to not be discriminated against using artificial intelligence when artificial intelligence is used to process your data. The next category is education. Um, two states passed a law that education in um, K to 12 or college must contain um, a way to understand how AI works and how to interact with AI. The law enforcement category is that law enforcement cannot use AI to create probable cause for your arrest. So that generally has to do with facial recognition. The legal status category has to do with AI cannot gain the legal status of a person. And the final category, misinformation or deep fake. These bills and laws create causes of action for someone who has been um, the victim of a deep fake. And for misinformation, it could also include something such as if an artificially created image is being used, it has to be disclaimed that it is an artificial image in whatever promotion it's going out to the public. Here's a quick map of the states that are emerging leaders in AI legislation. This was determined by me and the fellow researchers when we were looking at the states that have passed uh, AI privacy laws. So that's data privacy, creating a commission or task force, and um, they also have proposed bills that are still coming up. So they're kind of the, they're generating a lot of bills and laws that have to do with AI. So in general, looking at across the 50 states, there's four general approaches that states are taking to regulate AI. So the first one is to wait for federal regulation of AI. This eliminates that patchwork issue that I mentioned because the, the federal regulation will preempt the state. Um, so two examples of states that are doing this are Alaska and Kentucky. Neither of those states have any legislation having to do with AI. It is also possible that maybe they are sitting in their committees and formulating new bills, but as of right now, they don't have anything. Um, the second strategy could be enforce existing or enact new data privacy laws. Uh, there's an argument to be made that if you have a data privacy law, since data is how an AI can put out its final output, if you regulate the inputting data, you wouldn't need necessarily a separate AI bill because it would already be protected before that data goes into the algorithm. So two states that are doing this are Florida and Tennessee. Florida just passed a comprehensive data privacy bill and uh, Tennessee likewise has data privacy laws. 
The third approach is the sandbox program. So this is where you might have certain regulations barring AI being used either at all or in a certain way. And then different businesses will work with the state attorney's general office and be allowed to, I guess, essentially break that law, but they have permission to do so to see how the AI could interact. And then if it's found that the regulation is unnecessary or too strict, um, the legislature could then work to, to change the law. So that's uh, kind of an experimental um, laboratory type of approach. And then the final approach is to regulate AI using one of the below strategies. And those strategies are the strategies that were on the chart. So like creating a committee or task force, um, passing data privacy laws, requiring oversight or threshold requirements for AI's use, um, and creating a cause of action for citizens to seek remedies from AI related harms like discrimination, misinformation, or a deep fake. And these are the leaders in AI that I had on the map earlier. So that would be like California, Colorado, and Illinois all have several laws that work together to regulate AI. And so to conclude, we just wanted to say that, you know, CHHS is available as a resource to talk further about the legal landscape or about the, the policies of AI. And also there's institutional expertise here in the state of Maryland. So there are many different resources to look at from sociologists to lawyers to public policymakers, and we're available. Do you have any comments? Okay. Thank you both. Uh, questions, uh, Delegate Hill? Thank you very much. Um, in the, the, um, looking at the state bills, you looked at um, AI, did you also look at algorithm as a search term too? So we're creating algorithmic bias, whether analog or digital, as well as AI? Yes, we used um, several different synonyms for artificial intelligence, including machine learning. We even just did data processing. Um, so yes. Senator Watson. Thank you, Chair Kaiser. So help, help me break these two pieces down. As a engineer, I've done my bit of data mining and those types of things. And the difference between AI and decision support systems, right? So AI, it just seems like that, in, that implies evolution, inference, the ability to go beyond the initial data set to make other decisions, where you have your standard decision support systems, which we're already having challenges with. For example, if I purchase something on Facebook, then things related to that purchase will pop up. I assume that's decision support. Uh, we had a company come in and we had a piece of legislation we had to look at, which dealt with the law enforcement, where a private entity was able to scrape the web on all kinds of photos with the understanding that, or the belief that anything placed on the web is for public to help search for specific individuals. The challenge is, you know, from a privacy perspective, do I, even though I publish my photo and it can be considered public, do you as a private entity have the ability to use my photo in your de database to generate income to support a private investigator or what have you? So those, those, that was one bill that, you know, I did have significant conversation about. And, and, and then the other piece of this is, you know, I'm a wizard with Photoshop. I mean, I, I take some pretty bad photos and take myself out and put myself on a Hawaiian island. Now, if I do that, that's not the original photo. You know, how far down this rabbit trail do you, do you go? I mean, I've, I've taken photos of myself for campaign material and changed the color of my suit. I mean, the things you can do with technology, today are you know phenomenal with respect to images right and so there's the we're going to have to figure out what that balance is when is going too far too far i i'm willing to say that people's facebook posts they can be whoever go wherever they want to go all they got to do is plan a picture and sit back and look at all the likes and feel all warm and fuzzy right but where is too far and just Going back to the real question, can you distinguish for me the difference between artificial intelligence and decision support systems? Because it seems like they're so closely intertwined with what we see day to day. And I'm still trying to, I'm gonna have to go back and look at your sources because I wanna see what the specific legislation is and how we translate this emerging technology to 
state and local government entities protecting data, protecting our infrastructure, and those types of things. I know that was kind of long winded, but <laughs> go ahead. A uh, couple of things to answer your question. First, I would say that under the broad umbrella of artificial intelligence, there are subsets. So things like that decision making tree would be consider artificial intelligence, but it's more of a subset of the broader field. Uh, we did maintain a database of the actual legislative language, uh, which we're happy to share with the committee. Uh, and generally states have just through the legislative process sought to define, for example, what qualifies as a deep fake or as misinformation. Um, I know California, for example, as part of the CCPA, hewed closely to uh, mens rea requirements. Uh, so posting an image with the intent to deceive, which would be uh, adjudicated through a cause of action. Uh, but I hope that's a, at least start of an answer to the question. Follow up, based on what you've seen around the country, uh, deep fakes and those types of things impact different in different um, different jobs, different entities in different ways. And I guess the question is, should the states play a role in it or let the industry that's impacted figure it out? For example, we know there's been a writer's strike. Folks can go to chat GPT and create scripts and jokes and all of that stuff, putting people in jeopardy out of, out of business and all of that kind of stuff, right? I found a fascinating uh, on Good Morning America, it's it called, uh, it was related to Deepak Chopra, digital Deepak. And I mean, he took a, a hundred photos of his face in different locations. He was able to uh, synthesize his voice and he read in every book he ever did. So you can actually have a conversation with this guy. And it feels like you're talking to Deepak. And when you interviewed him, he said, I want something my kids and grandkids and great grandkids can learn from me and interact with me. And then the last piece is Harrison Ford with his new movie, Blockbuster, by the way. <laughs> he said he was asked specifically, do you have a problem with folks using your image? And he said with the studios he's been working on, they have every movie in his entire collection he ever did. And basically, as long as he's getting the royalties, he doesn't have a problem with it. And so in that instance, it seems like the media film industry may figure it out themselves. It seems like the music industry may figure it out themselves. And so with what you've been looking at from different states, what's, and I'm personally interested in making sure we harden our systems. That's kind of my focus because I work with NSA, but what areas do you think should be off limits to the state because industry will just figure it out? Does that make sense? And if you have an artificial intelligence algorithm that can help me predict the stock market, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> we'll get that to you uh, later. No, uh, yeah, I mean, the technology has gotten better. I've heard very compelling fake speeches by President Biden that have been generated by AI. I think uh, state legislatures are well situated to, to regulate it. I know that feels like sort of a cop out, uh, but... Uh, you know, I think our role is to inform on uh, what, what states have been doing, uh, whether something is apt for a sector specific regulation uh, is, is really up to individual legislators. And I think we're uh, happy to inform and, and understand the role that we can play as, as researchers in that. Um, and I just want to add that in our research of all the different state bills, we didn't cr come across any states that put out a statement like, we're going to hold off from regulating this because the industry, we think, will we'll figure it out. But um, I think typically they, they don't generally put out statements like that, so it's hard to know. I will say there were two states that adopted a resolution just praising AI and inviting it into the state, um, but that seemed to be economically motivated of, you know, bring your technology here so the state can benefit. So those were the two instances where there was kind of a, yes, bring the AI. So I have a I have another question, but I, I love the question that Senator Watson was asking. Uh, well, more than one that I wrote down, but you know what what is it that we should be doing and what we should leave to industry? And I guess that's a, a continuing question for us. Uh, but my question uh, goes back to something on the challenges to state regulation page when you were mentioning balancing innovation and protection of citizens. Um, the other thing is is nothing we legislate will stop AI, and so from that understanding and trying to figure out what is it, the what framework should we be developing, understanding, especially given what Senator Watson said about how 
in some cases we should leave it to industry. Um, but even if we regulate, how do we even know where it's happening? So I'm sure there might be someone whose intent is to get rid of all of AI and that's impossible, but we don't necessarily know that a business that's creating some product here or there is using it. So, I mean, isn't that too like a, a larger challenge as well with state or even federal regulations that it's, it's there whether we know about it, so. Um, so one example is um, California has a proposed law right now that every business that uses AI would need to essentially register or declare that they're using AI in their processes. So there could be a creation of a requirement, and then I, I'm not a legislature uh, legislator, but I assume there would be a fine if you if you hid the fact that you're using AI. So I think that could be one possibility of of knowing where it is or one strategy for doing so. Um, and then the EU takes a risk-based approach uh, so that the regulation is commensurate with the risk. Uh, so when we're talking about things like facial recognition, because that presents a risk, the European Parliament has decided that they're willing to consider stricter regulation. Uh, so it is very, it is going to be a sector-specific approach. I also think there are sectors uh, that we never thought would be interrupted by the AI revolution. For example, coding. Uh, there are now copyright claims by individuals who've spent their career developing code, uh, because if you ask ChatGPT or an other iterative AI system to develop a code, it's going to use somebody else's intellectual property. That's just as, as an example of how this is going to come up in a bunch of different settings that we have not considered. Uh, so I don't think you can address all of the problems with uh, a single year worth of legislation because of how quickly the technology is developing and how it's popping up in, in various sectors. Well, we, we never look at things from a single year perspective, but yes, I, I hear you. Thank you for that. All right, are there any other questions? Senator. Thank you very much. And thank you both for this fascinating com uh, conversation. Um, so I was, I was struck by the slide where you started with Congress, mm -hmm. where we talk about how Congress is creating a task force that requires a top to bottom review of existing AI policies across the federal government. And kind of on my own, I'd wondered, should we go through each state agency, or at least start with the big ones and figure out in each state agency, are we actually using AI? Are we buying AI? Are we regulating companies that use AI? And, and so, so we pair that with all these states that have task forces. I mean, are you able to give us a sense of what those task forces are doing and any differences between them? And are they, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is like, are they like embedded? Like, will they work year round to help on these specific things? Or are they really high level and broad, like the scope of this committee? Um. So since there were a number of states who had task forces and committees, I would say it, it varied. I, I lumped them into one group so that it was easy to see on the chart, but um, some of the task forces or committees were made up, like I said, of multiple stakeholders. So then they're more working on a year round basis and kind of keeping up with um, the technology as it progresses and then producing usually an annual or a biannual report. Um, and then there were committees who were much more focused on kind of the immediate moment we're in in time and so it was set to expire i think there was even a state who was trying to set up a permanent um i hesitate to call it an agency because that would be too broad but kind of a permanent office that would that would handle these issues so it, it ran the gambit can you tell me which state had that permanent office or, or offline is fine okay yeah um, i'll tell you offline yeah I think you mentioned it. Have have you seen there have been challenges between trying to get a handle on artificial intelligence and dealing with a business's propri proprietary products? I mean, it, it it just seems to me if I came up with a an AI ability to streamline, perform, or some kind of task, of course, I want to market that. But if I have to tell some regulator or some authority and register this and everything. You know, how do you how do you balance how do you balance that? I mean, have you seen any instances of that at all? I mean, I think we're still in the infancy and in this type okay. of regulation. Even the states that have enacted regulation uh, dealing with intellectual property and copyright, 
haven't contemplated something like chat GPT just yeah. because it's so new. So I don't think we have, at least thus far, um, a concrete example of something like that. For me, you know, kind of live in this world a little bit, it's, it's going to be very challenging for us as a body to distinguish between pure innovation and efficiency and effectiveness, even if it means losing some jobs, but that's what technology brings versus harm to society, to infrastructure, you know, to our way of life. And trying to just, just, you know, separate the two, it just seems like it's going to be very, very challenging for us. So I'm, I'd be curious to just tell me which state is the furthest ahead that I can start looking at. So I know you mentioned a couple, but which one is like, do you think they're really going leaps and bounds with respect to this? So I would say it's the, the perennial um, laboratory, California. They're the ones who are putting out the most bills and that are passing the most. Oh. But also I would look at their proposed bills as well. And you can California. see where they're trying to go with the, the regulation of data privacy and AI. Delegation trip to California, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going in person, not with deep fakes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I saw two lights flashing. We've got to keep this quick. So Delegate Feldmark and then um, it says Katie Hester over there, Delegate Hill. <laughs> You're sitting in my seat, Delegate. <laughs> um, and, and then like to remind you um, that we should all think of our questions, write them down now and follow up because this isn't going to be our last conversation. Delegate Feldmark. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. I want to go back to the uh, approaches to AI regulation and this um, sandbox strategy, and um, which I'm I'm really interested in. But I'm, if I'm understanding it correctly, there has to be some prohibition or restriction to start with that that this effort would be outside of, right? So, can you give um, some examples of what kinds of restrictions or prohibitions exist then with this little caveat that but we'll let you explore something in the sandbox yeah so the two states that have uh, deployed this program so far are arizona and utah and utah is one of the states that has um more meaning volume like a higher volume of data privacy laws and so I don't know what businesses or what program they've done to be outside of the law, but I'm just going to make one up. So like Utah, for example, has quite a bit of privacy rights around children and their data online. So maybe there was a business who wants to come up with some type of algorithm for toy marketing um, or social media marketing. They could work with the state attorney general of Utah and say, well, we're going to take the data of these children you know, that we otherwise would not be allowed to collect in this way and use it to test out this algorithm or this program that we're creating. And then they're working in tandem with um, the attorney general to have permission to do that. And again, that's just an example I made up, but um, that I think that would be how it would work. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm sort of following up on Senator Watson um, who seems very concerned that there are just so many things we could regulate that there's no way we could get our head around it, which is why we're having this meeting. Why are we looking in, in your research? Why would it be a good idea or not a good idea? What should be the focus? I mean, I know from what you've presented and what I've seen that there people are going at it for, it's not about controlling commerce, but it is, I presume, about stopping damage and that even before AI, when we had other algorithmic systems, we find as a state that we continue to pass laws to mitigate against damage that we inadvertently put in place by not looking at our systems in a proactive way. So is that what you think the thrust of all of this discussion is, or is it a Skynet that the machines and the apes are gonna take over and we're just trying to protect, I mean, why would we, why would you think it's important if you do that we take a look at what types of regulations, if any, we should be proposing? 
I would say two reasons. One is that you are better situated than the United States Congress. So even recognizing the problem of things like federal preemption and compliance issues with businesses having to comply with 50 state regulations. Uh, Congress is polarized. It can be relatively static. Uh, we saw last year that it was quite promising we were going to get a federal data privacy uh, bill. It died at the end of session. Um, so certainly as a, as a state legislature, uh, you're more well situated uh, to uh, put forward some, some type of proposal than the United States Congress. Um, otherwise, I mean, I, it's a very difficult question to answer. You are balancing uh, various risks and rewards, and ultimately it is a question of, uh, of values. And I think that's going to be something that's different for every single legislator who's considering one of these proposals. Um, there certainly are valid arguments to letting the market do its magic and accepting our AI overlords. And there are certainly arguments of uh, taking the EU's approach, which is getting out in front of this problem early, uh, coming up with a regulatory framework, even if, as has already happened, some of the major uh, AI companies, including Jet Chat GPT, have threatened to cease doing business within the European Union. So it really is a question of, of balancing those values. Thank you both, really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be in touch. I've got like a laundry list of additional detailed questions I want on several bills. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're going to transition to our third and final panel. Um, and I just had a, a process question. Um, we have seven folks on the agenda and we have four presentations. Do we actually have four, pe four people We've got four presenting and not seven. Fabulous. Okay. So then I would like to um, invite up the next panel. Please take your seats. I think I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves, but I think according to the presentations we have, we have Dr. Frank Farrow, Assistant Professor, Computer Science and Engineering, Dr. Cynthia Matusik, Assistant Professor, Computer Science and Engineering, Dr. Patricia Ordonez, Associate Professor, and Dr. Sanjay uh, Pro. I'm going to say this wrong. Paroshatham, Assistant Professor, Information Systems. Is that the right yes. quadruple quartet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, anyways, please feel free to correct me. Um, and anyways, what we really wanted to do was, um, I mean, the start of the last presentation and you know, all those concerns kind of really scared me. We wanted to make sure that this hearing, we were looking at the pros, you know, and the cons, the opportunities. We know we have amazing, you guys are doing amazing research. So we really just wanted to hear from you what the cutting edge of research on artificial intelligence and machine learning is uh, in the state of Maryland. And um, I think we're doing okay on time. You've got 20 minutes to present and 15 minutes for questions. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Frank Ferraro. Um, I am an assistant professor of computer science and electrical engineering at UMBC. Um, I received my doctorate at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and within AI and machine learning, my main area of focus is natural language processing. Um, and in the next slide, I'll sort of detail a little bit more about what natural language processing or NLP is. Um, but even within NLP, some of the main uh, areas of focus that I like to look at are uh, event semantics so broadly uh learning how to represent or manipulate or, or manage uh what happens or, or knowing what happens in complex events um so that could be say learning how an epidemic or some disease progression unfolds um or understanding the various steps processes and actors of uh let's say ied attacks um, or broadly just what happened in complex events. Um, one of the things I also like to look at um, is what's called grounded language learning. Um, and my colleague, Dr. Matusik, will uh, talk a little bit more about um, aspects of that. But broadly speaking, um, even though I like to really look at how language can be used, uh, we do not communicate information solely based on language, right? Our world, our actions are grounded in the actual world and visual signals. Um, and so part of my research looks at how can we merge a language with say visual signals that you might uh, have. Um, and the, the final aspect is learning with less than full supervision. Um, so my colleagues, Dr. Finan, Joshi and Mountain talked about machine learning and how uh, uh, we often train these machine learning models with various labeled input. Um, 
getting those labeled annotations can be expensive, it can be time consuming. And so one thread of my research is how can we learn effective models, learn effective systems, but with less uh, human uh, input into the input data um, and have it learn uh, more automatically. Uh, okay, so uh, within uh, natural language processing, um, sort of my, my one line summary of what NLP is, is building or providing tools that can take in human, human language based inputs, and then do various processing on that input to then enable some future action or decision. Um, to the right, I have a number of potential applications. Um, where NLP can, can be used or can be brought in. So for example, speech to text, chatbots, uh, machine translation. Um, you may have seen it in say the smart reply feature to emails. Um, so suggesting, you know, what's a, an initial response that you might have. Um, various forms of labeling or summarization. So you take in a document and you want a nice crisp label of this article is about sports or this article is about finance or uh, legislation or whatnot. Um, there's also broader aspects of, say, corpus exploration. Um, so if you have thousands or millions of documents, going through all of that is exceedingly difficult and time consuming. And so you can build systems using NLP to broadly say, what is the gist of the themes of the content across all of these thousands or millions of documents? Um, and part of that is also then looking at information extraction, so identifying the who, what, when, uh, and where of a document, a situation, or an event. Um, to the left at the bottom, um, I just uh, have a very brief example of ChatGPT, since most people have probably have been hearing about it a lot. Um, to, to very broadly uh, summarize it, ChatGPT uh, is exceedingly good at mimicry, so it has been trained to effectively, uh, given some previous context words, predict what the next word is likely to be. So for example, it might take in terabytes of internet uh, language, and then uh, for an initial prefix of the fluffy cat, it would then want to learn what the most likely word following the phrase the fluffy cat is going to be, where it might be meows, but maybe other options are purrs or potentially something like roars, but maybe not chirps, right? So that's, that's uh, very broadly speaking, effectively what chat GPT is, learning what the next word is likely to be, but learning that across uh, terabytes and terabytes of internet data internet language. Um, and so I, I use NLP um, at UMBC um, broadly uh, to develop NLP methods for understanding events that then enable deeper comprehension and decision making, where uh, that comprehension and decision making can run the gamut from understanding from a document who was affected. So if you have some document or some documents discussing, let's say the historic rainfalls or floods, you wanna know who was affected or more broadly speaking, what happened, or there might be some claim about the flood, some claim C about the flood. And you want to know, is this claim likely to be true or not true? And can you justify that explanation? Um, and so uh, at UMBC, oh, apologies, um, uh, we've developed, um, various new semantic understanding methods um, uh, that broadly support generalized awareness in AI. Um, and just on the following slide, I have a very uh, brief overview um, of the types of, of areas and applications that my lab has looked at, um, such as uh, using these deeper semantics to generate common sense explanations of why, um, to developing core novel machine learning techniques, um, to using deeper semantics to help identify misinformation or extract information from documents related to cybersecurity, um, to improving the prediction of what is going to happen, not just next, but say uh, five steps out uh, in the future. Um, and so uh, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Matuzic, um, where, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. 
Okay. Um, there we go. I'm Cynthia Matuzic. I'm an associate professor of computer science at UMBC. And my research focuses on robotics and the interaction between robotics and language, um, how people can use robots in human spaces naturally and comfortably, which covers a lot of space, not just robotics, but also, you know, brings in machine learning and questions of computational ethics. Um, Robotics is very much a growth field, and there are a number of groups at UMBC working in robotics. Some of the key areas that are being addressed at UMBC is robotics for elder care, um, robotics education, how can we build a, a workforce that's well-educated in artificial intelligence and robotics questions, and ethical questions, the role of robots in society, and bias in machine learning, and especially what we call human-robot interaction. The idea behind human robot interaction is you want to be able to deploy robots that can actually work with people in human spaces. So you want to have a robot maybe in your house helping you with household tasks or in schools or in spaces like hospitals. And for that, robots need to be able to interact gracefully and intuitively with the people around them. And they need to be flexible in these sort of changing settings and settings outside the lab, outside the laboratory and outside like factories where things are well defined. They need to handle the chaos that comes with human settings. And how we tackle that is by using language to build robots that can interact with humans in this mechanism that people are already comfortable with. So you want to be able to explain to a robot, you know, this is what I want you to do. This is what the things in your environment are. You know, this is what's going on in this novel space. And language is natural and intuitive. People already know how to use language for the most part, but it's also a difficult research problem, as my colleague said. And it, a lot of it revolves around machine learning, which is very much a data hungry problem. So we do this by tying together the idea of natural language, the idea of language that's being used in the, these spaces with the physical awareness that robots bring with sensors. So if you wanna do something like teach a robot how to help you fold clothing in the way that you prefer, um, you need something like a camera, right? Just using language to say, then fold it like this, then fold it like this is an extremely difficult problem. But once you get cameras and you know robot arms that are doing things, you can say, no, no, more like this. Um, that's what we call grounded language, language where the language isn't in a vacuum, but it has meaning in terms of what robots can see and do in the world. And obviously automation in the workforce is a very big topic that people are really interested in right now. And we think in robotics, we think of robotics in the workforce as ideally occurring in what we call these four Ds spaces, work that's dull, dirty, dangerous or dear work that's very difficult or expensive, or just work that we don't have enough people to do it, right? Work where we don't want people doing those tasks or we don't have enough people to do those tasks, like elder care. And it's worth noting that automation takes jobs or you know, can have an impact on workforce displacement, but it can also create jobs, not just jobs for people like robot operators and robot maintenance, but also tasks where people are interacting with robots in order to do things collaboratively. Maybe performing a task jointly where the robot is doing the lift something heavy part and a human is doing the insert screws to attach a part. Um, and all of this depends heavily on having a workforce that has some AI literacy, that has some AI education, uh, which my colleague will talk about shortly. Now, because a lot of modern robotics relies on machine learning, it's important that we discuss or at least you know, acknowledge the existence of bias in machine learning problems. And bias in machine learning problems can be inherited from the data, right? If you use bias training data from you know, the last hundred years, then you're going to get biased outputs. 
But there are other ways that bias can creep into trained systems like robots. And one of the big things is not having diversity in the space of people who are building those systems. So part of what we work on in my lab is ensuring that we've got robots that work for everybody so that we don't have these situations where you deploy a voice assistant and it only works for a subcategory of the people in the space. And we do that by ensuring diversity or trying to ensure diversity at every stage of the development process. So broadly speaking, um, my research focuses on building robots that work well with people in the human world to do these kind of collaborative tasks in order to perform tasks that we need them to do, either collaborative work in human environments or tasks where there's a shortage of people to do them. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my colleague Sanjay. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sanjay Prashottam. Um, and thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to the joint committee today. I'm a resident of Old Ellicott City. Thank you for representing District 9, uh, Senator Hester. Uh, today, I'll talk about um, uh, research work happening in my lab, uh, which is on AI for health and climate sciences. Uh, brief introduction about myself. I'm a tenure track assistant professor in the Department of Information Systems at uh, UMBC. Um, I received my PhD in electrical engineering and did my postdoctoral training in computer science at the University of Southern California. My main research interests and passionate are in uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and how they can be applied to several uh, domains, uh, such as healthcare, climate sciences, um, and cybersecurity. Before I talk about the, the work happening in my lab, I want to briefly introduce the work which is happening in the IS department as well as in our CSE department. Um, so our uh, department um, faculty conduct interdisciplinary research in five uh, complementary core uh, areas of design, development, and uh, implementation of information systems to uh, investigate real world problems, including climate change, um, cybersecurity, accessibility. Uh, the AI faculty in the department focus on um, uh, both the, for solving fundamental problems as well as use inspired research in many domain sciences like health, healthcare, uh, earth, climate science, space sciences, et cetera. Next, I'll briefly talk about the work uh, which is happening in my lab. Uh, so I've been working on uh, applying uh, machine learning AI to healthcare domain for the past uh, seven to eight years. Uh, in particular, uh, my research team is interested in uh, seeing how we can enable smart healthcare, uh, where we are adding towards by use of AI and machine learning technology. Uh, as we know, because of the several regulation passed by the uh, US government, uh, now it is uh, mandatory for many of the uh, uh, healthcare providers to uh, enable data stored in electronic health record format. So there's huge amount of digital health data available. And the key question is how can we leverage this huge amount of data to learn meaningful representations for patients and uh, diseases so that we can enable personalized diagnosis uh, prediction for the patient. So this is enabling the precision medic medicine initiative. Uh, on the right hand side, I'm showing a block diagram of a system we built where we showed the deep learning uh, algorithms which can focus on which can focus on different uh, parts of the images to predict and answer questions about the medical image. And uh, the important thing to note here is we not only make it uh, um, teach the system to learn what's there in the image, but we also want the system to explain how it learned about what's there in the image. So you want to have some confidence in uh, the predictions. So uh, this work has been uh, um, uh, supported through NSF uh, uh, CRI award, and all this work has been enabled through collaborators with domain scientists at University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine, uh, doctors, oncologists uh, at School of Medicine, as well as my collaborators at uh, Virginia Tech and USC. Uh, recently, my lab is focused on uh, developing uh, deep learning methods for cancer survival analysis. Uh, as you know, cancer is uh, one of the uh, difficult diseases, and uh, we have Cancer Moonshot Initiative by President Biden, which focuses on trying to solve cancer. And if a patient is uh, diagnosed with cancer, they ask a very fundamental question, how long will I live? 
will I die from this disease? It's very important for us to answer these questions accurately. And my research team is working with oncologists and collaborate at uh, University of Maryland uh, School of Medicine to uh, investigate how to develop AI machine learning tools to accurately predict patient survival outcomes, because this has impact on patients, their families, doctors, hospitals. Uh, uh, recently, I'm working with uh, uh, collaborators at NIH and uh, uh, Buzelin, where we are looking at how do we detect pain in cancer patients using uh, multimodal AI technology. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, recently, I was awarded NSF's career award, where I plan to focus on, in the next five years, I plan to focus on building trustworthy and robust FedEx learning for healthcare. Uh, as we know, healthcare data is siloed at different hospitals and uh, data sharing is a big problem. So there's a big push in the industry to look at developing models and sharing the models with uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders so that they can use the uh, well-trained models for achieving better predictions. Uh, a brief note on the work I've been doing with my collaborators at NASA and NOAA. Uh, we are looking at how we can um, build, uh, develop machine learning algorithms to accurately retrieve uh, cloud properties uh, from different satellites. Um, and for this, we are actually training uh, deep learning models uh, to account for uh, different types of uh, uh, challenges like 3D, 3D radiation effects for retrieving, retrieving cloud uh, properties like cloud optical thickness and cloud effective radius, because these have very important, they play an important role in how clouds uh, it, uh, act for the, or act for the climate change or impact climate change. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, this is something I got uh, excited and uh, got involved in very recently. So we are looking at how we can use machine learning models to predict gravity waves from remote sensing uh, data. And recently, as we all know, uh, NASA launched the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, and I'm working with my collaborators at NASA uh, and uh, who are also working at UMBC on exploiting machine learning techniques to distinguish and understand what's how the universe came about. Basically, we are trying to answer a very simple question like, how do we classify stars and black holes based on the ionizing sources? And this can inform us future observation campaigns. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'll start introducing myself because uh... It, it's just, I'm a Marylander. I want you to know that. <laughs> I moved to Maryland when um, my family came uh, from Tennessee at, at, at three years old. And so I've lived in Essex, Reisterstown, and settled in Columbia. <laughs> and I just, um, I wanted to share that part of myself. And then I lived in Puerto Rico for about 10 years and came back to Colombia and I'm living in Wild Lake. So I grew up in Oakland Mills. Thank you. <laughs> and so I wanted to make sure everyone knew that. All right. So now let me just tell you a little bit um, about the research I do in AI. I improve outcomes in critical care units through machine learning and visual analytics. And we're going to, you know, change that also to multimodal. It's not just going to be visual, but we're trying to, you know, change that noise that you hear in critical care and make it into something that doesn't, you know, fail OSHA standards, which it does right now. Um, and then reduce health and education disparities in underserved and overlooked communities. Um, and um, I'm an assistant, associate professor in information systems. I spent 10 years in Puerto Rico as an assistant and later an associate professor in computer science um, at the University of Puerto Rico. Rio Piedras is like the Berkeley of Puerto Rico, so you can understand uh, the, the relevance. Um, and then the other thing that I was going to say is that um, I got my MS and PhD at UMBC. So I am an M UMBC alum. How do you change this down? Yeah, okay, there we go. I, I am gonna tell you my path because it's, I wanna tell you that I was a statistics. I actually started at Johns Hopkins, got in, I won, got into ele electrical engineering and they were just starting the computer science program and I didn't even know about it. Um, but I was one of like five women in the mini computers classroom and, uh, Shortly after that class, I got my first C, never had had a C, and I dropped computer science, right? Um, I was actually featured in the NPR episode 576, if you want to listen to it, about why women leave computing. Um, and I was featured because I came back, and that's like a really weird 
uh, thing, apparently, because then I got also interviewed by the New York Times for that. But the, the idea, the, what I'm trying to tell you is that the research I'm doing now actually is trying to make more women who have quit back then come back. Right. And also make it so that the new women that are going in don't quit. Um, and so what happened is when I finished Hopkins, I switched to a math major because I was really good at math. And then I got tired of science and math. So I did languages so I could do a semester abroad. And I became a Spanish and math teacher for many years in high school, um, two private schools, the George School and um, Glen Oak Country School. So I did come back <laughs> and also. Um, and then what happened is that I kind of went into a black hole. I was tired of like seeing my students. My students got me really excited about computer science. And I thought, I got to get back. Like, there's got to be some way to get back. And then I got a job with a tech company, a startup. And it was the most demoralizing thing. The way they trained you was not the way you train. It's not the way they teach. Um, and so I became a trainer instead of technical support because it was just so demeaning in the in the and tech support, those of us who have worked that, no, <laughs> tech support is probably the worst. Um, and so I became a technical trainer. And in that technical training space, I actually went to public, what it was, it was um, the certification, section eight certification software. So I went actually across the nation to public housing across the nation. Um, and what I did a lot of data entry. And what I noticed was that there's no matter whether my the neighborhood was like, a Latino and Asian in LA or African American or uh, in North Carolina um, and or white in West Virginia, um, it didn't matter. I was putting in families, like the data was families. And I didn't really understand that. Like why were there so many people with the same last name? Um, and I'm just saying that because this ties back to my research, <laughs> okay? Um, and then what happened is that I got a job. Um, I actually went traveling through Latin America and that's a whole other thing. But it was, I saw that there was, no matter where I went, no matter how poor, there was always like a cyber cafe. And that was the way that these people, I was able to connect with my family. So that I, basically these cyber cafes were the way that I could do this. Um, and so the technical, what I came back and did was I got a job at a technical training company. So all these people that are doing boot camps, I was doing that way back in 2000. And I can just tell you that that's very shallow learning, but it gave me the confidence to be able to come back into do a PhD in computer science, right? Um, and once I had that and I got into the PhD program, I was able in my second year, thanks to the wonderful training at UMBC, they had a promise program that taught me about what academia was, that taught me how to talk, talk to my professors, that taught me about fellowships. So by the second year there, I actually got a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship um, so that I could pay for my PhD. I got um, a, a summer internship at IBM, Almaden. Um, Dr. Joshi over here was my advisor at that time. And he, I actually got the job first at Watson where they wanted me to be a web programmer. And I said, he told me, you got to say no. And I was like, what? He's like, no, you're not going to be a web programmer. You're going to be a researcher. And then I got the call for Almaden. And so I'm just telling you this because that guidance and that fact that a professor sees what you can be is so important. And eventually through the Promise program, I also got the ability to go to my dream college of all time was MIT. And I did research there. And the research that I do is actually based on what I learned there. And I still have collaborations with them. And I go and do hackathons with the critical care around the world. I've done hackathons in Latin, all, all across Latin America, Colombia, Chile, Peru. Um, and so anyway, I ended up in the University of Puerto Rico where I went into the classroom and nobody understood what computer science was. And I say this to you because this happens in the schools and the rural parts of this state and across the country. And I know that because I work with expanding computing education pathways. Um, and so that is, is, is critical about why we need computer science education and AI education so that people understand what AI is and they don't fear it, especially because they hear all about the biases and they hear like, oh my gosh, things are just going to, to, uh, to, to hurt me. So anyway, eventually I went to, to uh, Facebook and did an internship as faculty. And um, that I learned also, like I couldn't find any local Latinos working there. I found one 
And the way she got in is because she changed her name. So it showed me the biases and the algorithms. She had to change her name from Rocio to Rosie. And that's how she got her first interview and was able to get in. So that I'm just saying this to support every, all the research that the people are doing. So now I'm at, in information systems at UMBC. And the research, I just, I'll show you ways. I am doing this research because I think one, one of the things that I'm trying to do is make ML and AI platforms um, for healthcare that are open source. So that even though, you know, it's gonna do well, I found in Puerto Rico that people from L UCLA, Ch UCLA Children's Center were like developing it. And then they were charging $20,000 <laughs> for them yearly. That was too much money but they had their own platform. And so if we make this open source, these, these you know, poor countries and nations can actually get access to this and create their own AI research, especially with everything that we do now, right? There's so many tools for AI that people could implement themselves, but they need to understand what they are. So again, AI education is critical. Now, opportunity, what I see now, we have the EDA that's basically trying to do this recompete pilot program. We have Governor Moore that says that students, high school graduating students need to do some sort of service. Well, and then we also have this transformation that's happening at public housing across the state. Actually here in Annapolis, I think you, there was a law passed to, to make it by 2036. All of them will be you know, done in some form or another. There's a, and I'm working, trying to get into that so that I can actually do um, some some um, work. So the idea here is to create community. My research is to do community computing learning centers that provides digital and tech training to women heads of households in public housing. Now, why women heads of households in public housing? Because they are going to stay until they can get their children out, right? And so we, one of the things that I got when I was work, talking to these communities is that you go in there and the tech training comes and it's great, but it leaves. So we really need to create the, to empower these women and teach them so they can create these computational learning ecosystems that will help reduce educational health and financial disparities in their society. And why do we want to do that? Because they are the ones that have the knowledge on how to do that. Instead of looking at them as like objects of our research or objects of the study and how do we do it, help them be part of what we do, right? And so these whole, basically we want eventually these computing and uh, these community computing learning centers to do computing and AI education, research and development so that eventually they can become, their children will be the students that come prepared because the, the education system is just too slow to do it through schools. I've been trying to do it for 10 years in Puerto Rico and we're up to 180 teachers, but that's not 180 schools, right? This way, if we go to the communities, they take charge and there's so much stuff thanks to the pandemic there's so many things online that we if we give them the technical savvy to use them they can teach themselves right and i say to this because um this is actually a homeless single mother that was featured in newbie.com um uh code newbie.com podcast um and she talks about her journey trying to get out of you know, she was literally homeless with her children and trying to see how she can get them out. And the best way she found was actually through becoming a coder and, you know, learning how to code and then actually being hired as a tester. She's not, we need testers. And by going through that process of being a tester, then they understand vulnerabilities. They understand how software works. And then she can move up. She actually only knows how to do web development um, not software, but I know that if she, the more she falls in love with it, the further she'll go. So what I proposed and what I started doing was uh, called BT2G Learning Centers, be bold to grow, be brave to grow, born to grow, right? Um, the idea, and those are later on in the thing, um, the idea is that we create a text. When you look at the text, the, a lot of these, you see the young people, you don't see the older people, you don't see the mothers. And the thing about including the mothers is the mothers will pass it down to their children. And the, the wonderful thing is we are now starting computer science education research for children at UMBC. Um, and so we can learn how we can teach them AI, how to engage with robots, how to so that it's, not, it's something that they see in their community. 
Um, and so I just wanted to talk to you about this, which is what we did in Puerto Rico that was really worked, which, uh, which really worked so well to, to get um, the high schools there is research practice partnerships um, in education. Um, and so we can actually do AI with through education, through creative tech, through cybersecurity and entrepreneurship. We can show them how with using tools with AI, they can become entrepreneurs. And then that has the capability of uplifting their communities. Um, again, um, that's the model. So right now I show this to my the students that I'm training. I, we did a, a small like pre-pilot to, to work with the community that we're doing where we took two leaders. We tried to recruit four. The mothers with children dropped out and we ended up with the grandmothers who used to be single mothers. And they're the ones that are gonna be leading this. So I'm learning as we go that maybe the grandmothers are the ones we need to, to focus on. Um, and, but basically we want moms and, and the moms and children to be agents of knowledge and not just the objects of the studies. So they make us create the implementation, analyze it, and then we can scale it. So um, right now, I just wanted to end, I did want to write down the, fun, the like what the goals are. I can't read it with my glasses. So I want to give mom the hopes of realizing their dreams out of public housing. I get emotional about this, sorry. <laughs> children, the hope of the American dream and that they see themselves in computing. I don't know why this happens to me every time. Um, uh, and they see themselves and their community in computing. I want to see my local students who were like me um, and give them a chance to develop their skills and, and build their computing identity so they can pass the, the entry level classes and keep going and break the cycle of generational poverty and do research in their own communities. I want to fill the gap in the highly skilled um, expertise. We don't have many locals. I taught a class this year, 45 and 43 students in data mining, 43, uh, 43 students, 42 were international. Like we really have to tackle that problem. Um, and that's, uh, that's data mining, right? That's critical to anything that we do. Um, and then I just wanted to tell you some of the, um, and then we also need social scientists. So by creating these tech hubs, we the, instead of our students doing like work study, working at the local, you know, Chick-fil-A on campus and the Starbucks, they could be working at these hubs, our graduate students. <laughs> um, and then if they're international and doing that, they're learning about the culture of the United States. They're learning about these disparities and they can take that home with them if they go, or they know about it if they stay, right? Dr. Ordonez? Yes. Uh, we are down to like eight minutes and we need a uh, seven Perfect. minutes and we need a little time for questions yes, for the thank four you. of you. So I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry thank you, for, thank you, thank you. No, sorry for I'm cutting sorry. You off. It always happens. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, questions from colleagues. I know that I have one for one of the professors. Any other, anybody have questions? Mm -hmm. um, if not, uh, my question, uh, Dr. Sanjay, you're going to have to tell me how to pronounce your last name again, and then I'll ask my question of you, if that's all right. Uh, my last name is Purushottam. Purushottam. Uh, on, on your third slide, AI research at the Information uh, Systems Department, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned all, all those categories of areas of AI for sciences and use-inspired research. And I don't know if I really have a question now as much as wanting some additional information later understand from your perspective of your seven or eight bullets here of what are the categories in which it works or what the concerns should be in those different areas. So uh, that, that's more of a follow-up, but that slide really fascinated me as um, just um, an issue for further understanding. Sure. I'll be happy to like uh, send you off inf information offline with the okay. faculty as well as the related research happening in the domain. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Uh, are there questions from other colleagues? Um, uh, Delegate Bartlett, sure. go ahead. Thank you. Um, since we have that quick little moment, um, my question is for uh, Dr. Ordonez. Um, you mentioned noise in critical care. Were you literally talking about the noise that you always hear in mm -hmm. critical? Okay, so that is fascinating to me because we're talking about healing. Mm -hmm. And it's so frustrating mm -hmm. to hear that noise. And oftentimes people will come in and they'll just say, it's broken, it's broken, it's broken. And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. So when you were talking about um, possibly um, some type of innovation to control that, were you thinking of something sort of like maybe just like a, a pager could go off for that medical 
practitioner or what were you thinking about when you talked about that noise in critical care? So there's ways right now um, that people are analyzing uh, astrophysical data um, through music. Uh, and so that there's ways that you have music that shows what it is. And it's it's actually very, it, it sounds very healing when you hear that music. But when there's something wrong, you can hear it without it being that blatant. And so it's basically, I'm working with the, the, the um, she's actually a Puerto Rican blind astrophysicist. And so I'm working with her on trying to develop that for, for, um, for medicine. So it'll be a more pleasing tone. Yes. Okay. And gotcha. that, that physicians would be trained to hear it or right. the nurses or whoever's, but the stu the, fa the, the people in there, they would hear like a slight something, right. but it's, it's really astonishing how much the ear can detect actually more than our, than our eyes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Delegate Kerr, I think, with the last question and then we'll have closing remarks. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Prashantham, um, you mentioned cybersecurity. I'm wondering, are we, is the technology at the point where AI can be used to launch a cybersecurity attack that is then detected unsupervised by AI and stopped? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think um, Dr. Anupam Joshi is an expert in cybersecurity. Uh, in my uh, perspective, uh, it can be done. So AI can be used to uh, defend against attacks created by AI. Uh, and there's a lot of research work happening in that space. I think Dr. Joshi can elaborate more if, if he has time, yeah. And then, um, but we were told about the thousands of cybersecurity jobs that are vacant right now. What does that say about the future of the profession of cybersecurity if we're able to use AI to do what human intervention is doing now? Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, maybe I have to come back to you with an yeah, answer. Yeah, that's fine. I, I uh, just would like to, you don't have to tell me now, but I'd like to know, looking forward, what are the implications for that? Thank you. Thank Chair. you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that great question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you for to all three panels, to the members. Remember that if you have follow-up questions, to funnel them through the, the committee staff so we can send not just you know 12 different requests to everyone, but just send a few uh, requests. And so then we can all get the answers as a, as a full committee. And I uh, just wanna appreciate this and to members that we will continue on this path of trying to get a better understanding of AI and what if anything we can do in the state uh, moving forward. And then I'll pass things off to my chair, co-chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I, I had two, two things. The, the first was that in addition to questions for this specific panel, I would welcome committee members' ideas on how we shape and who we hear from at the October meeting. I mean, this was obviously all university and we did that kind of on purpose because I didn't know where to start, you know, inviting the, the companies or the advocates or whoever. So um, think about both questions for that related to what you heard today, but also where we're going and who you want to hear speak and what you um, what questions you are. The other thing is I wanted to give a quick shout out. I have four former pages who are interning with me this summer. If you guys want to stand up, we have uh, Shelby, Aiden, Lucas, and Vedant. So thank you. Welcome back to the General Assembly. You can be seated. <laughs> Um, and so I guess with that, we're probably adjourned. Thank you all so much for your time and sharing your years, decades uh, experience with us. Thank you. <laughs>